So um, hello everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much also for uh, inviting me here to give a talk. So well, so indeed, welcome to my talk on uh, second quantized Shannon theory. Um, so this is going to be a story uh, in in sort of three parts. So roughly based on these uh, three papers, which you can see here, uh, which are joint work with my PhD supervisors, Giulio Kiribella and Jonathan Barrett, as well as Augustin van Rietveld and Mike Mao. Now, uh, obviously with only um, one hour or 45 minutes to talk, I won't be able to tell you all of the, everything that happens in these papers, but rather I'm going to try and give you a general thread that runs through all three of these works, um, really about the kind of structural features on superpositions of channels. So I'm going to discuss in this talk so the superpositions of channels in also called a coherent control of quantum channels, which uh, we use to construct the so-called second quantized channel theory that I will um, describe later. And the three parts of the talk are roughly going to correspond to the following three themes uh, on this topic. Uh, the first part will be about sending a single particle along a superposition of alternative paths in order to construct a superposition of two channels. The second part of the talk will uh, be about extending this idea to sending a single particle at a superposition of alternative times going through a quantum channel with correlations in time and thus probing those correlations uh, at different points in time with only a single quantum particle. And in the final part of the talk, I'm going to tell you why uh, the standard quantum circuit formalism cannot faithfully describe these scenarios of superpositions of channels. And as a consequence, I will describe to you our extended framework called rooted quantum circuits, which we believe adequately does describe scenarios, including those of superpositions of channels. So, um, before proceeding to the three main parts of the talk, uh, I'm going to uh, present a short introduction to the general themes of superpositions of channels. Um, but at this point, I should make a little uh, announcement. So uh, as some of you might know, uh, one year ago, I had a serious problem with my throat and I wasn't able to talk um, very easily for several months. So I'm much better now, but I still wouldn't be able to talk continuously on my own for one hour. So what I've done is I am going to present uh, this introduction, the conclusions and answer questions live, um, but I've pre-recorded the three main parts of the talk. Um, uh, so I will be playing those from my screen share and to make it feel more live, I'm going to stop between the three parts so you can ask questions uh, in the meantime. Um, and so maybe we can have a sort of five minutes questions in the middle rather than all 15 minutes at the end. Um, and just uh, in case you haven't um, used th these kind of, seen these kind of talks before where I'm, I'm actually presenting through my camera, um, you will need to um, spotlight me on your Zoom screen. Um, but when I'm screen sharing, then you can just view my screen. All right, so let's proceed with the part zero on the introduction. So the idea of superpositions of channels uh, originated um, maybe in the 90s with the works of Aharonov and collaborators, where they were thinking about the possibility of superpositions of time evolutions of quantum states. So we all know that when we take, sorry, of quantum channels, but so we all know that with quantum states, uh, it is easy, you can just to take superposition. So if you have two quantum states, you can just take the two together and construct a superposition of the two states. And so a natural question arises whether you can do the same for quantum channels. So given two quantum channels, is there some way to kind of construct a superposition of the two channels? Now, uh, this, this kind of concept of taking two quantum channels and finding them in a superposition in the in a sort of modern quantum information formalism uh, was really first studied by Daniel Oy and Johann Oberg uh, 
in the early 2000s, uh, where they had really a kind of interferometric picture and imagined what happens if you put two quantum channels on two arms of the inter interferometer. And they studied this both mathematically and, and, and physically, in particular from a quantum optics point of view. So this kind of phenomena has had many names in the past. So Orberg, for example, called it gluing of completely positive maps. Uh, Oi would call it uh, interference of quantum channels. And uh, Haronov called it sort of superpositions of time evolutions. And recent, more recent literature on uh, kind of uh, relating to computation has typically called it control of, of unitaries or control of quantum channels. Uh, we will typically be using the term superposition here, but might also use the others interchangeably. So in order to understand the significance of control of quantum channels, let's start by going back to thinking about how quantum computing or quantum channel theory generalizes standard classical computing or, or standard classical communication. So in a classical setting, we typically have some bits, so, so some set from the, some booleans, and we send it through a function that acts on these booleans and, and spits out some more bits. In the quantum case, this is generalized to the possibility of sending quantum states over Hilbert space. And uh, then this can be evolved through a unitary and spit out again some quantum states over Hilbert space, which crucially can be thought of as superpositions of the classical basis states. Now, the second scenario when we might be interested in is communication, which is typically described theoretically by what we call Shannon theory, and in a quantum case, quantum Shannon theory. So the, the, it's similar to the case of computation, but crucially the difference is that instead of having an agent performing local operations uh, that act on the states locally, you have a noisy transmission line that extends in space from a sender in one place to a receiver at a different place. Um, and the, this quantum state undergoes some noise that is not in control of these communicating parties in between them. So classically, you would be able to send some bits, for example, uh, the coin that I've drawn here. And then the quantum case is generalized to allowing the information carriers to be quantum states. Um, for example, a single photon where the message is encoded in its polarization degree of freedom. And this raises a natural question when we think about superpositions of information carriers. So can also the choice of computation or the choice of transmission line be in a quantum superposition? And if so, then we can say that we have reached a second level of quantization of Shannon theory or of computing, where not only the information carriers are quantum, but the configuration of the operations themselves are in the quantum state. Now, this idea of coherent control or superposition of channels has attracted a wide variety of interest in recent years. And here I've just um, pointed out some uh, recent references, which is not uh, by any means meant to be a complete list. But uh, again, from the two perspectives, these uh, ideas have, have, have shown various kind of advantages. So um, in, in, the, in the case of computation, this is um, this problem has often been referred to as the control of unknown unitaries. So the idea here is that sort of if, um, if I give you uh, a unitary, if I give you some, some unitary gate that you don't really know, it's sort of as a black box, can you control whether you apply this unitary or some other unitary or, or the identities? Uh, alternatively, you can really think of it as a kind of quant quantum generalization of the if clause in, in computation. So uh, let's say if I were to, were, to, were to write a Python program, I might have if and elif and else clauses. But imagine if the quantum control system is in a superposition of all the different things that would have, would have led to the if and the elif and the else, then I could really have a superposition of all these different operations, um, which is sort of the coherent control of quantum channels. So this can have really significant applications to to quantum computing. But in this talk, we're going to focus on the communication perspective, where uh, various works have shown that combining noisy quantum channels, like multiple noisy quantum channels in a superposition, 
So if a single particle is sent through multiple quantum channels in superposition, then the independent, different independent noisy processes on the different parts can actually interfere destructively and cancel out the noise, leading to a less noisy channel overall. Now, it is important to note that the question posed at the beginning, how might one want to construct such a superposition of channels, is actually a, a very quite a complicated question. So a kind of simple answer whether it's even possible in principle is actually no, not really, because if I give you two quantum channels, it is not possible to construct a, a kind of well-defined superposition of the two channels without specifying additional information. So these various works that have discussed this previously have, um, including our own works, um, have sort of different ways in, in presenting how one how this additional information is specified. And in this talk, I will be uh, talking about a one, one way, which uh, is, we call the vacuum extensions of quantum channels, which is kind of related to a, a field theoretic point of view of the devices implementing these quantum channels. So as I said, uh, here we will focus on communication, in particular communication using single photons. But it is important to note that the results uh, will also pertain, at least the theoretical structural results will pertain to any scenarios involving coherent control superpositions of quantum channels. So at this point, uh, let us now proceed to part one on the superposition of parts, uh, which will be pre-recorded. So let's proceed with part one on the superposition of parts. So as we saw at the beginning, it is not possible to construct a superposition of two quantum channels by knowing only the information of what the two channels themselves are, but we need to specify some additional information. So there are various ways to do this. For example, we could consider the Steinspring dilation of the two individual channels. But in this talk, we're going to take uh, an operational approach which considers what we call the vacuum extensions of the channels which is inspired by the field theoretic description of the physical devices implementing the quantum channels. So let's start with a single quantum channel. So physically, a quantum channel models the action of some physical device, for example, a transmission line between Alice and Bob. Now, this could be, for example, an optical fiber transmitting single photons, um, so transmitting a message of single photons through, for example, the polarization degree of freedom of the single photon. So then we would have this transmission line described by a channel which we call curly A, acting on the single photon polarization degree of freedom, which we denote as capital A. So typically what we would do in communication scenarios involving this channel, this transmission line, would be to send our single photon with message encoded in the polarization through the optical fiber. However, when we don't send any message through the optical fiber, the optical fiber is still there. And so physically, this can be described as the optical fiber acting on the vacuum state. In this case, the vacuum state of the electromagnetic field. So all in all, we can model the action of the optical fiber or our transmission line as a quantum channel, so a completely positive trace preserving map, acting on the direct sum of the single particle polarization and the vacuum sectors. So we call a channel A tilde a vacuum extension of some channel A if it acts as the original channel A when restricted to the uh, original Hilbert space we were interested in, for example, the single particle polarization, and acts as the identity on the vacuum. And here we assume that the vacuum is a, um, a one-dimensional sector. Now, crucially, just saying that this vacuum extended channel acts as the original channel when restricted to the original Hilbert space and as the identity on the vacuum does not fully specify how the vacuum extended channel acts because it can act non-trivially on off-diagonal elements or superpositions of a single particle and vacuum. Mathematically, this is characterized by what we call the 
vacuum amplitudes. So if we pick a Krauss representation of our original channel, let's say Ki, then a Krauss representation of the vacuum extended channel will be of the form Ki direct sum alpha i identity on the vacuum, where alpha i are some complex coefficients whose squares or modulus squares sum up to 1. So we call the alpha i the vacuum amplitudes. And to kind of understand a simple physical picture, uh, let's just consider the, the case of unitaries to have a concrete example. So for a unitary, there is just one class operator and the vacuum amplitude is just a single complex number alpha at the, um, with modulus 1, so it's just a complex phase e to the i phi. Now, if we take this unitary and we forget about what happens to the vacuum, then this phase phi just becomes a global phase, and that's why it is not relevant when we were considering our original model of the transmission line, which did not include the vacuum. And it's important here to specify that given any physical device, the vacuum amplitude is uniquely determined by the physics governing the particular situation. So in, in, in this case, of course, it will be completely determined by the Hamiltonian um, of the physical scenario. For example, the Hamiltonian governing the evolution of the particles through the transmission line. Now, uh, a quick note that if you're interested in a kind of resource theoretic approach to how vacuum extended channels are used in communication, then you can also see our paper, um, Resource Theories of Communication um, in NJP, which uh, was also the subject of my QPL talk last year. Now, let's go back to the case where we were thinking about combining two channels in a superposition. So we've got our two vacuum extended channels now, let's say. So if I have two vacuum extended channels, I can put them together and combine them in parallel. So let's consider now what are the Hilbert spaces of the inputs and outputs of this combination in parallel. So let's just take, for example, the input systems. So the total input of this combined channel a tilde tensor B tilde is A direct sum vacuum tensor B direct sum vacuum, where A is the Hilbert space of the original channel A and B is the Hilbert space of the original channel B. So these could, for example, be uh, the polarization sectors of uh, single photons. Now, if you expand out uh, the tensor and direct sums, you get that this input system is equal to the following equation you can see here in red, which includes a two-particle sector, A tensor B, so that means that you have a particle in both of the two channels. It has a one-particle sector, A tensor VAC plus VAC tensor B, which corresponds to the fact that you have one particle in either of the two channels, and it has a vacuum sector, VAC tensor VAC. So now we're going to use this in order to define a superposition of channels. So we define a superposition of two channels, A and B, specified by some given vacuum extensions, A tilde and B tilde, as the parallel composition of the two channels, so A tilde tends to B tilde, restricted to it's one particle sector. So mathematically, this is done as follows. So imagine that I have some message I want to send. So this could be uh, a message encoded, let's say, in the polarization of the single photon. And I initialize my photon in a path degree of freedom that is a qubit, and I initialize it in a plus state. So it's an equal superposition of going in the left path or on the right path. So then we have a message, which is, let's say, a d-dimensional system in general. Uh, in our case of the single photon polarization, it's two-dimensional. But in general, it's d-dimensional. 
and we have a path that is a two-dimensional system. So then this message sensor path is exactly isomorphic to the one particle sector of the composite channel we considered earlier. And you can see this by considering this isomorphism u, which we define as u acting on some state psi of the message, tensor the zero path, i.e. the path going to the left, is isomorphic to saying that the message is sent to the left path and the vacuum is sent to the right path. And equivalently, uh, the message sent to the one path is equivalent to the vacuum going on the left-hand side and the message being sent on the right-hand side. So this isomorphism is essentially an isomorphism between the kind of particle picture and the mode picture. Um, and it's kind of easy to, to see how this would work in practice. For example, in an interferometer, um, in quantum optics, then in the picture in white, you can see that essentially what we'll do is initialize a single photon going to one arm of an interferometer and the vacuum in the other arm, combine the two through a beam splitter, 50-50 beam splitter in this case, and then put the vacuum extended channels A tilde and B tilde on either arm and we combine them at the end. Now, an interesting feature here is that the superposition of two channels is completely determined by one operator, which we call the vacuum interference operator F for each channel. So if we have a superposition of two different channels, there will be two vacuum interference operators at play. But for now, let's just consider the simple case where we have a superposition of two identical channels. So the vacuum interference operator F is equal to the sum of the, of the alpha i's uh, conjugated, so the vacuum amplitudes we had earlier. So remember, this would typically be, let's say for unitary, just a complex phase, times the corresponding cross operator of the original channel, Ki, and you would sum over all of these. And this gives you the an operator F that is invariant under any change of cross representation of the new vacuum extended channel, A tilde. So if we consider the simple case of a superposition of two identical channels, um, then in the equation you can see here at the bottom, the output of the superposition of two identical channels just consists of a sum of two terms, one with the path in the plus state, one with the path in the minus state. And on each of those two terms, you've got one term, which is just A of rho, so the original channel, and another term that is F rho F dagger, so the vacuum interference operator acting on the input state with either a plus or a minus, depending on the state of the path. So now we have seen how to construct operationally uh, a superposition of two channels, and we have seen that they are completely characterized by a single um, operator, a vacuum interference operator F. Well, then we can see how this was useful in practice. Um, and as I've said, in this talk, I will consider um, communication advantages as the kind of main motivation for considering superpositions for channels. So there are several different examples that have been studied. Um, and in this talk, I'm just going to describe one example, which is an example where a quantum channel, which is completely noisy for quantum information, so that cannot transmit any quantum information, when two such copies are combined in a superposition, they are able to transmit um, a quantum state perfectly with 25% uh, of the time. So let's consider two dephasing channels. Uh, D of rho, so it's a, an equal sum of uh, Pauli x and Pauli y. Well, this is zero quantum capacity because it completely dephases any message you send through it, typically. But now let's consider vacuum extending um, our Pauli gates. So let's consider vacuum extensions of the form. So x is the vacuum extended to x direct sum e to the i phi x. Uh, identity on the vacuum, and y to y direct sum e to the i phi y, identity on the vacuum. Now let's use two such copies of the completely dephasing 
channel in a superposition, well then, we find that if the difference between the two phases, phi x and phi y, is an integer multiple of pi, then the output of the superposed channel is equal to the following expression you can see here in white. And crucially, on the minus path term, so if, the, if you measure the path in the minus state, then we know that the message is in the state q rho q dagger, where q is a unitary gate. So whenever you measure the path in the minus state, you can perfectly correct the message, which means that, uh, and this happens 25% of the time. So it means that we get perfect transmission of quantum states 25% of the time, even though the two channels which we started with were completely dephasing and did not allow any quantum communication at all. So this really op opens up a new paradigm in which quantum channels can be controlled in a quantum manner with respect to each other, which can lead to many interesting communication advantages that some of which have already been explored and some are yet to be found. Um, and I can say, I'm happy to say that this protocol was recently verified experimentally in Vienna um, in our paper and by Julia Rubino et al. All right, so now we have seen how to combine two quantum channels in a superposition of paths. But it is important to note that we have made a crucial assumption here, which is that the two channels we were combining are independent. But that need not always be the case. In fact, in many practical scenarios, uh, two channels could be correlated. So for example, we could have two quantum channels that are uh, implemented by some devices that are close to each other in space and therefore experience some correlations due to interactions. But even more interestingly, you could imagine that we have a single transmission line that is being used at multiple points in time. And therefore, the multi successive uses of this transmission line are correlated in time. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to discuss an extension of the previous formalism of combining quantum channels in a superposition. So instead of combining them in a superposition of paths, we will think about superpositions of times, and in particular look at the correlations that are present in such scenarios. So now we come to part two on the superposition of times. So let's temporarily set aside the discussions we've just had on the superposition of channels and consider once again just an ordinary transmission line between Alice and Bob. Now in general, when we send some message between Alice and Bob through a transmission line, this message will undergo some errors. Now in many physical scenarios, the errors occurring on successive uses of the same transmission line will in general be correlated. For example, if we take our good old example of the single photon being sent through an optical fiber with information being encoded in its polarization degree of freedom, then typically the random fluctuations in bifringence of the optical fiber will lead to some random fluctuations in the polarization. But since these fluctuations happen at a finite time scale, you would expect that photons sent at nearby times will experience similar or correlated errors. So these kind of transmission lines which have correlations in the errors between successive times we call correlated quantum channels. And in general these would be mathematically described by a quantum comb. But here for simplicity let us just consider a two-step random unitary channel. That is, we consider a quantum channel which acts on the joint state of a particle being sent at time t0 and another particle being sent at time t1. So we call that state here rho in this red equation you can see. 
and the time t0, some random unitary um is being applied, and at time t1, another random unitary u subscript n is being applied, and there, is, there are correlations described by a joint probability distribution p of mn, which describe the correlations between the choice of unitaries and the two time steps. So for example, these unitaries could be the Pauli matrices in the case of a qubit channel. So the point here is that classically, if we have such a correlated quantum channel, or a, let's say a correlated classical channel in the classical case, we would have to send one particle at time t0 and another particle at time t1 in order to actually probe these correlations. So the correlations are not accessible to a classical particle that only travels through the quantum or classical channel once. But in the case of quantum particles, one might wonder whether it's possible to actually probe these correlations by sending only a single quantum particle once through the quantum channel. And as we will see later, it turns out that the answer is indeed positive. So the way that this is achieved is, again, using the formalism of superposition of channels, in this case, superposition of correlated channels in time. So mathematically, we start again by considering the vacuum extensions. So we take our two-step random unitary channel we just described, and we say that each random unitary UM consists of a direct sum of some unitary VM on the internal degree of freedom, uh, for example, the single photon polarization. So direct sum with the identity on the vacuum, but crucially with some complex phase phi m between the one particle and the vacuum sectors. And so once again, using the same mathematical formalism we described in part one of this talk, we control the time of transmission by some quantum degree of freedom. Now this time, instead of using the path, we use, for example, a time bin degree of freedom of a single photon. And so when this control state, for example, the time of transmission is in the ket zero state, the message is sent through the first application of the channel and the vacuum state is sent through the second application and vice versa when the control is in the state one. And in this case, when the control is initialized in the plus state, we get a effective channel that describes the transmission at a superposition of times, which is given by this blue equation you can see here. And crucially, this output state depends both on the probability distribution P of Mn between the choices of unitaries in the two applications, and it depends on these vacuum phases phi m and phi n between the one particle and vacuum sectors. Now, why is this important? Well, as we just said earlier, classically, we would need at least two particles to probe the correlations between successive uses of a correlated transmission line. But here, since the output channel of the superposition of times when only a single particle is sent, we find that it, this depends already on the correlations between the two users of the channel. Then we have found that contrary to classical intuition, a single quantum particle can probe these correlations even though it is only sent through the channel once, albeit in a superposition of times. So once again, we can ask how this could be useful in practice. And I'm going to illustrate this with a kind of extreme example of a communication advantage. So this is probably the, the most powerful classical communication advantage we have found, which is describes kind of an extreme case, but of course, um, for less fine-tuned parameters, there are also other less extreme advantages available. So let's consider this specific case where we have a 
transmission line which is completely depolarizing on the message at any given moment in time. So if I send just a single particle once through the channel, it, the message gets completely depolarized and I cannot transmit any classical information through it. Now, the completely depolarizing channel can be described mathematically uh, in the qubit case as a randomization over the four Pauli unitaries. So now let's consider the case of such a, a channel which is described by this completely depolarizing channel at any time step, but has correlations between the time steps described by some permutation sigma, which permutes the choice of unitaries, in particular such that the identity in X are swapped and the Y and Z are swapped. And we pick the vacuum phases as specified here at the top in yellow. So phi x minus phi of the identity is equal to zero and the phase difference between the z and y phases is pi over two. Now in this particular choice of parameters, we find that the using these transmission lines as a superposition of times, in fact, gives us a perfect classical transmission line. So a transmission line with unit classical capacity. So strikingly, we've taken a transmission line which is completely depolarizing any time step and transformed it into a perfect communication channel for classical information when used at the superposition of times. And interestingly here again, this crucially does rely on the correlations because similar protocols have been proposed before. So for example, you can see the paper by Alistair Abbott and co-workers where they considered combining two com independent completely depolarizing channels in a superposition of paths. And they found that this um, gives non-zero classical capacity. However, the classical capacity will never reach one in this case. So without correlations. So correlations are essential for the communication advantages, the particular class of communication advantages that uh, we see here. Now I'm happy also to say that we have an experimental collaboration underway at Imperial College London where the quantum optics experimental group is working to implement um, an experiment the ideas and communication advantages um, we have discussed here. So now we have seen how to construct a superposition of two quantum channels, either through a superposition of paths or a superposition of times with either independent or correlated channels. But the question remains how this can be depicted faithfully in quantum circuits. And this is the topic of the third part of this talk. In part three of this talk, I'm going to explain why the standard formalism of quantum circuits does not adequately describe the scenarios, such as superpositions of channels we discussed earlier, and provide a solution to this problem, namely the extended formalism of rooted quantum circuits. Now, just to mention here that the rooted quantum circuits formalism also applies to various other physical scenarios, such as the causal decomposition of unitaries and many other scenarios in quantum optics, for example, where we have a non-trivial blend of direct sums and tensor products of Hilbert spaces. But in the following, I'm only going to concentrate on um, the examples pertaining to superpositions of channels. So let's begin with a recap of the scenario we had before. So we are constructing a superposition of two channels A and B specified by the vacuum extensions A tilde and B tilde. So there are really two interesting things going on here. So first of all, there is a preservation of particle number in each channel. So if I put a single particle in my input of the A tilde channel, then I get a single particle out. And if I put the vacuum in the input, then I also get the vacuum out. 
So there are constraints on the output sector depending on the input sector, and we call this sectorial constraints. Now, secondly, there are also correlations between the sectors and the input of one channel and the input sectors of the other channel. Because we have decided to restrict our product to the one particle sector when we define the superposition of channels. So if I put a particle in the A tilde channel, that is, I am in the sector A in that channel, then I must be in the sector VAC in the other channel. I have a vacuum in channel B tilde. So this gives us correlations between the sectors of two independent channels, which we call sectorial correlations. Now the problem is that in standard quantum circuits, so for example in the circuit picture that I've drawn earlier to depict the superposition of two channels, neither the sectorial constraints nor the sectorial correlations are actually directly visible from the diagram. So if I just look at the diagram directly, there's no way I can see that I can't have, for example, vacuum in both of the channels or a single particle in both of the channels or that I have, let's say, a particle going into A tilde and a vacuum coming out. I wouldn't be able to see that this is impossible unless I actually dive down and, and do some calculations by checking the definition of the isomorphism U, which we saw earlier was the isomorphism between the message sensor path systems and the one particle sector. So the diagram itself doesn't give us these crucial features about the composition of the different systems. And this is really a problem. In fact, it's quite a severe limitation of the circuit framework in this particular case, because the point of drawing or having a diagrammatic representation of quantum channels is to be able to understand and, and really depict graphically the crucial features of how they compose. But here we have here the crucial features of the composition of the channels is really ingrained in the sectorial constraint and the sectorial correlations. Otherwise, looking at this picture, it just looks as if we have the tensor product of the two channels, an ordinary parallel composition. But that's not the point, because here we really have something different, a superposition of the two channels, which we would like to depict graphically. So our solution is to introduce rooted circuits where the sectorial constraints and the sectorial correlations are both explicit. So let's start with the same example of superposition of two channels. And the essential ingredient is that here, each Hilbert space that we are interested in is given an indexed partition. So for example, the Hilbert space, which we earlier called A directs him back is now, we now kind of refer to it as A subscript K, which consists of an A0 sector corresponding to the vacuum sector and an A1 sector corresponding to the message sector, which we originally just called A. Now here for simplicity, let us first assume that the channels are both unitary channels here. Now we draw the diagram by putting these indexed systems onto the wires in a way that respects the sectorial constraints and sectorial correlations with an implicit direct sum over all of the indices in any given slice that we could construct from the diagram. So for example, let's consider the two wires AK and BK bar, where K bar means not K. Well, in this case, we see that we have a direct sum over A0, B1 and A1, B0. So we directly see that either we have the particle in the left-hand channel and the vacuum in the right-hand channel, or vice versa. Anything else is not possible. And similarly, if we look at the sectorial constraints, we can see that by looking at, the, for example, the A tilde channel, we have an input with AK and an output AK. So we have got K in both in the input and the output. It's not AK and then AL, some other index. So this means that whatever sector we started with, at the in, started with at the input must also be the one that's at the output. 
Now, formally, this is defined using this notion of roots. So to each linear map F that we draw in the diagram, we assign a relation or a Boolean matrix, which we call the root. For example, lambda. Now for each value of the indices on this lambda, for example, lambda KLM, is either zero or one, depending on whether it is possible for the corresponding sectors of the systems with these indices to be populated at once. So it's zero if they are, cannot be populated and it's one if it can be populated. So for example, for the simple case of a vacuum extended channel which preserves a number of particles, then the root is just a chronic delta. So if I have a, an AK system as the input and an AL system as the output, then my root here is just a chronic delta of KL because if I have k equals zero in the input, then I must also have l equals zero at the output, and so on. Now, of course, uh, we can also come up with examples where we have more complicated roots than just the chronic deltas. So let's consider as a simple example where we don't have just chronic delta roots um, a case of loss of particles. So we start off again with sending a single particle in the superposition of two paths, left and right. So our initial root is still the chronic delta k l bar. So either we have particle in, in A or, or in, in, in B. But now imagine if the A tilde channel actually is no longer an ordinary vacuum extension, but is able to destroy the particle. Well, then the root corresponding to that channel is some omega km with three ones and one zero, corresponding to the three possibilities of vacuum going to vacuum, one particle going to one particle, and one particle going to vacuum, but not the vacuum going to particle. So this concludes the short introduction to the framework of rooted maps. And just to explain what else we might have in the paper if you're interested, we generalize the case of unitary channels to general quantum channels and mixed states, where you'd have sort of two indices per wire. And in that case, we can model decoherence quite nicely, and we can even model kind of the, the extent to which a superposition of two channels is coherent. And finally, for those of you who might be wondering to what extent this is really formal, we also prove in the paper that rooted circuits form a symmetric monodal category um, where the objects are the partition Hilbert spaces and the morphisms are the maps and the roots together. So this takes us to the conclusions. All right, so sorry about um, taking so uh, taking up to 58 minutes. Um, I, the recording was only 36, so I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but I will just very briefly conclude now in one minute. So uh, we have seen how to construct a superposition of two channels by forming, uh, by sending a single particle along a superposition of two paths. Similarly, we've seen how sending a single particle a superposition of alternative times through a time correlated channel can allow us to probe the correlations at multiple time steps with only a single quantum particle that traverses the channel once. Now there are some more exotic configurations in the same spirit that we haven't discussed here, for example, superpositions of orders and superpositions of the direction of communication. And we have seen how these scenarios can be represented graphically using uh, quantum circuits, rooted quantum circuits. Now, for future works, uh, there are various things that one might want to do, but I, for now, I would say that the most exciting application that we're working on now is trying to uh, work on rooted quantum circuits for indefinite causal order scenarios. And you can already see in an earlier um, version of the rooted circuits framework in the paper by Jonathan Barrett and co-workers, 
you can already see uh, implementations of quantum switch. So we wonder here to what extent or what class of operations in definite causal order one might be able to draw in rooted circuits. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you want to hear more about the topics I've talked about today, then please uh, watch the unscheduled talks by Augustin van Rietveld, and number five on rooted quantum circuits and number two on coherent control of quantum channels.